Um, good evening. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm supposed to use the yeah, mic. Yeah, use the mic. Yeah. Use the mic? Yeah. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Can we roam? You want to use the hand mic? That's okay. People don't know how to do that. That's not right. Oh, okay. Because we have us. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'll call that for you. Uh, it's really an honor to be with you this evening. And I say that all the time as a politician, but the fact is tonight, I, I use my professorial job tonight because I actually enjoy uh, an opportunity to come back uh, to Northeastern and to remember my experience here. I hope it'll be more fun than it was when I was an engineering student, but it can't be any less. Uh, the, uh, but, I, but I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, the nonprofit sector uh, and its relationship to government and the private sector. Before I do that, uh, and I spent some time literally as a mechanical engineer in a private company doing engineering uh, before I ended up teaching science and, and being an organizer. So I know a little bit about what that world feels like. Um, and I'll tell you a funny story about it in a minute, but I also spent some time in government, uh, as, you, as you heard, uh, and have now come back to the nonprofit sector. I started four nonprofits myself. We did consulting for about 400 nonprofits before, and now we have about 650 in the current network of nonprofits. So I, I, I feel like it's clear that I can't hold on a job. <laughs> but I sort of do have across all of those sectors at one time or another. Let me ask you the, the same question. How many of you here have been directly involved as an employee of a nonprofit? As an employee, so most of you really. How many of you have been involved as a volunteer of a nonprofit? Okay, and how many of you have been involved as an employee in government? Uh, gosh, at least almost half. Uh, and how many of you have had experience uh, as an employee in the private sector. Well, then you can just have this mic. <laughs> uh, They'll get their chance. Yeah, I guess you will. Uh, well, the reason I ask is because, uh, as you know, the, the lines are, are quite fuzzy. And uh, if you've spent all of your life in one of those sectors, it's pretty difficult to get a sense of respect and understanding for the others. But you folks obviously have had a good deal of experience in all of them. So, um, what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about currently the sector that I'm in and its relationship to the other sectors as I've experienced it um, and as I've thought about it. Um, but I'll try, I've been given 20 minutes, so I'll try to be very brief. I'm going to start with, um, let's see, how do I do, how do I get this? Yes, click on Is, is the link live? Yeah. Should be. Okay. 
little bit of an overview to give you a sense of a little bit of the range we're talking about. Um, that's my, uh, get me back to the real world. saw a few minutes ago is primarily uh, national and global in scope. Um, in Massachusetts, um, we rank ninth in the country for the number of active registered nonprofits in the state. Uh, people get shocked when they hear this number. There are 22,000 registered nonprofits in Massachusetts. Um, it's interesting how it breaks down. It actually breaks down uh, quite a bit once you begin to think about nonprofits that are active. There are about maybe 10,000 that are not active. We just, I just helped work with the uh, Charities Division at the Attorney General's Office to make it easier to go out of business. It's very interesting because um, in order to become a nonprofit and get your 501c3 from the feds, it's relatively complicated. You have to get a lawyer, you have to think, get a board, you have to do a variety of things, and then you have to start submitting reports. To go out of business is much more difficult much more difficult. In order to get out of, go out of business in Massachusetts as a nonprofit, you have to go to the Supreme Judicial Court and get permission to go out of business. <coughs> At least you did until August. Uh, we just signed in a bill that would make it possible for the Charities Division to allow you to go out of business if you have no assets. And if you have assets, less than 25,000, he, the, I say he, Dave, Dave uh, um, Less, but the division will allow you to go out of business, may or may not. They may tell you to go to the Supreme Court, or they may give you permission. If you're more than that, you still have to go to the Supreme Court. So it was very difficult to go out of business as a nonprofit. So it's just like um, if, you, if you had to go to the President of the United States to get permission to go out of business, if you were a pizza shop, we have more pizza shops in Massachusetts than in any other state in the country. That's why there's so many nonprofits. So about 10,000 of those really aren't functioning. Uh, but that still leaves a lot of nonprofits, about 12,000. About 9,000 have at least one staff person. Um, and, um, uh, and within that one staff person, about 14% of the state's workforce is in the nonprofit sector. That compares, by the way, to the public sector. Um, favorably in the sense that there are more people who work for the nonprofit sector in Massachusetts <coughs> than who work for all three levels of government combined, state, local, and federal. Uh, so it's the largest sector, larger than the government sector. Um, the question about nonprofits, why do nonprofits exist? Well, one can argue market failure. Um, that is, there, there are desired uh, services or collective goods that do not have sufficient potential for profit to attract business, provi business providers. Homeless people represent a need for housing, but not an economic demand for housing. So the distinction between need and demand is not well understood in the mind of the public often, but it's a, it's a foundational distinction when it comes to market economies. Um, there are public services that the nonprofit sector will not provide that may include the cost or the limited constituent that, that desires the service. For example, ever heard of orphan drugs? Uh, orphan drugs are a good example. There are people who need certain drugs. Life or death needs. Life or death needs who don't get those drugs without the orphan drug laboratory, which we, by the way, created in Massachusetts, that does research on drugs for which there will never be sufficient market to support uh, through the drug companies. And yet, without those drugs, people die. So the externality there is, the state does the research. Anybody else think of an example like that for which there is clearly a demand, clearly a need, but for which there's no demand? Any, any, any other ideas that fit that category? Certain kinds of mental health services. Certain kinds of mental health services, exactly. Have you, have you ever looked at a school, local school budget and noticed that, and this is my beef with charter schools, by the way, uh, that there's one child in the school that could cost the school $350,000. And that child may never learn to read. That child may never learn to read. So what do we do with that child? 
We give them an education. We educate them to their capacity. We've chosen to do that under the IDEA, the federal special education. We've chosen as a society to say that all children, and the word all means kids with learning disabilities, will receive the education to which they are entitled, meaning which they can handle, which they can, where they can reach their maximum potential. Well, let's look at it. $350,000 for a child, there's simply not a demand for those services, but there's clearly a need. So these are the whole, the whole range of third party payments like that. Uh, those are called market failures. Um, also, um, there's, a, there's a need but not a demand for clean air, right? Because of the excludability <coughs> criteria. You can't exclude people from clean air. So why should you, so you can't sell it. If you can't sell it, there's no market for it. That doesn't mean there isn't a need for clean air. As a matter of fact, without it, none of us would be around. So there are a lot of examples like that, of need that is not demand, that is addressed by either governmental services or the nonprofit sector or some combination. And sometimes by the private sector through contracted services. With more than a billion dollars in revenues, 207,000 billion in, in assets, and close to 467,000 workers, the nonprofit sector is an economic force, even though people think of it as a sink for private sector dollars. It actually is a source. All three sectors add, add value. Um, nonprofits hold state government contracts worth two and a half billion dollars. Let me make a point about privatization here, if I can, before I forget. Um, and we'll talk about financial sector in a minute. Do you know that under Bill Weld, the state uh, workforce dropped by almost a third during the four years in which he was governor? And of course, Charlie Baker will take credit for that. Um, so think about that. That makes clearly makes government more efficient with fewer state workers. Well, where did these efficiencies come from? They came primarily by privatizing human service work. The vast majority of those savings came out of some out of health and human service work. So those positions were privatized. Oh, it's in yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife wants me to bring home some bread. Fair enough. You, get, you know, I did that one time. I didn't show it off here. Yeah, you can show it off. Uh, <laughs> I did. It says ring your bell and go to zero. There you go. Anybody else? It's a brand new phone. I'm a victim. I'm a victim of it. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that if you look at if you look at uh, where the savings came from, they came from the fact that now these people are what are called O3 con contractors. They're on contract. Right? What does that mean? Hey, now I need to be a business person, right? Well, what that really means is you no longer have health care. You no longer have a retirement system. You no longer have workers. You have virtually no benefits whatsoever. And if you look at the 30% approximately that benefits are as a percentage of, of, of salaries in most nonprofits, that's where the savings came from, from privatizing jobs with, and taking people's benefits away. That's not cost saving. It's cost shifting. It's cost shifting to the people who do the work. But it certainly looks good when when you start looking at state budgets. Unique characteristics of, of nonprofits. I when I say unique, I really this is a little bit of a stretch because I happen to be uh, uh, in the nonprofit sector now, so I tend to tend to celebrate it a little more. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the where money is spent by nonprofits, it tends to get spent locally. It tend to get it tends to get spent on employees and and people in need to in a way that those dollars tend to get spent as opposed to, quote, invested, i.e., they get spent locally. Any amount of money that gets spent locally, uh, Barry will tell you, tends to have a higher multiplier. And if you have a higher multiplier, you ultimately get more long-term public benefit from those investments. Less outsourcing, essentially the same thing. The three E's, efficiency, effectiveness, and essentiality. I, mean, I would say this. People tend to perceive, when we've looked at some of the research, tend to perceive the, the nonprofit sector as less 
efficient, less effective, and non-essential. That's generally well uh, understood among the quote public at large. Well, if you actually look at the efficiency of nonprofits, what you find is primarily because they have a lot of people who are paid lower wages, where they they have a higher, they literally have a higher education level per dollar of salary than the for-profit sector does. So one can imagine there might even be higher margins because of uh, if, if if there's any correlation between effectiveness, efficiency, and education. Um, Effectiveness, you know, so we do more, we do it less. Effectiveness, we do good, yes, but we do it well. There's another perception that nonprofits do nice things, um, but they're not particularly effective at it. Well, if you actually look at the comparison, you do a comparison between comparable industries, like childcare, like home care, you actually don't find a difference at all in terms of ratings by patients in quality of service. In ratings and in terms of health care and education outcomes, you do not see a, a difference. Um, uh, and then in terms of essential, you know, people say, well, nonprofits are essential. I mean, are nice but not necessary. You know, doing real work is the private sector. Uh, and uh, the, the nonprofits sort of do nice things. Well, as it turns out, if you pull the nonprofits out of Boston tomorrow, the city would shut down in less than 24 hours. Because why? Well. We, you know, our parents need us. They're in nursing homes. They're cared for. Uh, most of which are, are, are nonprofits. So if my, my nobody's taking care of my parent, how am I going to go to work? If nobody takes care of my kid during the day, how am I going to go to work? Uh, if you if you begin to look at some of the things that nonprofits do, you realize that without them, things just stop. Yeah, there are things that are nice, like garden in the woods, which you know you can, we all know you can do without culture. I've done it for years. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but uh, the truth of the matter is that, the, 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 that those three E's, if you will, effective defense, do apply to the nonprofits when you do the research. But it's, uh, it's really not well understood. How do you measure a smile? This is the other piece about culture. If you walk into a nursing home and you look at what's going on in the eyes of the caregiver and the eyes of the senior, what you find are things that can't be captured by an economic model. And yet, in many ways, they sort of define the reason for that activity, for that care. And you, it's really hard to build an economic model that measures that. They also, the point about efficiency, you know, I'm not sure that the for-profit se sector is more efficient depending upon the nature of the task at hand, depending upon the nature of the task at hand and the complexity of the task at hand, and whether things are more efficient uh, if they're more equitable, or less efficient if they're more equitable? I think the answer to that question is it depends on the activity itself. Um, responsibilities of government, as you said earlier, you, you went through this, so I'll do this, uh, uh, Chris, I'll do this quickly. You're absolutely right. Uh, infrastructure, public safety, health and human services, education and culture. <coughs> These are responsibilities, not necessarily tasks of government, right? But they don't have to be carried out by government. They can, they can be responsibilities. One we left out is the protection of civil rights and equal opportunity. Your point about fairness. Uh, if it isn't government that protects it. Yeah, you can have that. Why don't you take it outside and put it in the water? Um, uh, all, uh, protect civil rights. Whose job is it to protect civil rights if it isn't government? Right? So government has some absolute critical responsibilities, public safety, and that's, they can't be offloaded. It simply can't be offloaded. Uh, all, of, all of them involve creating positive externalities or reducing negative externalities, or they shouldn't be performed by government at all. Right? That's the whole notion. Anything that can be privatized, that has the capacity for excludability, can be subjected to a market. Um, and uh, all are provided directly and or through contracted Government services. You can you can provide a lot of these services uh, through for-profit and non-profit entities. The government has a has a final responsibility. Um, and by the way, this is sort of also not well understood. All three sectors create value. There's this notion that the private sector creates value, and the government sector and the non-profit sector absorb value. 
That's, that's not to <laughs> ask any uh, president of a Fortune 500. And they'll tell you, you know, um, we create value and we get taxed uh, by people who use value. Um, but if you actually go and do a measurement, a chronometric measurement, you'll find that people who care for someone in a, in a nursing home add value. They create value, a service without which there would be less economic value um, in society. So that's a revolutionary concept in many ways. And here's the best example of it that I can see. This is Walter Williams is a professor, I think, at the University of Wisconsin, an economics professor. He says the fundamental difference between nonprofit organizations and their profit making counterparts is that nonprofits tend to take a greater portion of their compensation from easier working conditions, more time off, favors, and under the table payments. Profit making organizations take a greater portion of their compensation in cash except those that are highly regulated. In the profit-making world, there is a much greater monitoring of behavior of people who act for the organization. Profit-making organizations have a financial bottom line that they must meet, or sooner or later, heads will roll. Not so with nonprofits, which have no bottom line to meet. On top of that, incompetence for nonprofits means bigger budgets, higher pay, and less oversight. I wonder if the 250 teachers that got laid off in Rhode Island last week realized that uh, they must be working for the private sector. Um, this is very interesting. Only one in 10 Americans believes that char char charities are ethical in their use of donated funds. Um, the, the perception of the nonprofit sector uh, is really uh, belies the reality. And uh, unless you spend time in it, I don't think you, you, you quite get it. I found this little. Um, chart together in terms of my own basic analysis, and I'll be really quick on this because I know we have uh, a much better speaker and a much more compelling presentation in a minute. But I wanted to just give you a sense of my, um, my orientation around how these three these sectors differ. If you look at where we are now in terms of a recession, what you find is that demand for government services goes up as revenue is going down little secret that the Reaganites won't share with you about taxes is that in an expansion, it's almost impossible to raise taxes. In a recession, it's crazy to raise taxes. <laughs> Therefore, we always cut taxes, right? You cut them, you cut taxes in, in a recession to stimulate the economy, and you never raise taxes in an in, in expansion because you don't need to. Therefore, we've gone from, in Massachusetts, fourth in the country in terms of total tax burden, down to Barry, what is it today, 26, 27, in terms of total tax burden. How did we do that? We did it by cutting taxes in a recession and cutting spending, uh, I mean, in, excuse me, cutting spending in a recession and cutting taxes in an expansion. That's how we, we got here. A for -pro in a for-profit firm, in a recession, Revenue goes down. Thank you. In a recession, for profit, uh, revenue goes down. But we forget that demand also goes down. So while your fixed costs still have to be met, your marginal costs go down. That's not true in government. It's also not true uh, in the nonprofit sector. Demand goes up, revenue goes down, and nonprofits have no taxing capacity. The externalities are pretty straightforward. The receiver of the public good pays for the benefit through taxation. Uh, For-profit markets will simply not supply the public good. There's no excludability for the product. And uh, you, you cannot price, therefore, the product. Uh, and, and so government has to have a responsibility for providing. Uh, the for-profit system provides less than it receives. Um, uh, excuse me, provides, um, yeah, in other words, there has to be some kind of margin for profit. Uh, and the taxation of profit is its way of addressing positive and ne negative externalities. As a businessman will tell you, a businesswoman, I paid my taxes. I paid my taxes. So they don't bother me with, with asking me for donations. That's a governmental responsibility to take care of people. Um, or they might argue the reverse and say, you should tax me less because I'll provide for, for these needs uh, privately, although that really has uh, worked out in practice. Um, the nonprofit serves as a target population and provides an externality. For example, um, 
Childhood uh, health care, aesthetically improving parks, gives more service than it receives. In other words, nonprofits provide for externalities as well. The source of funding isn't always taxation. Sometimes it's donations, sometimes it's government, uh, government grants, sometimes it's philanthropy. But um, there are clearly externalities, that is, things for which there would not be a purchasing uh, activity for a product uh, that a nonprofit can provide. And sometimes it's like clean air uh, that you simply can't exclude people from. And in terms of taxes, um, the government has taxing power, for profits are taxed, non nonprofits are tax exempt, uh, and therefore have a lot more accountability, by the way. You, those of you who run nonprofits know about the 990 reporting requirement, right? The federal government has just changed its reporting requirement from four pages to 19 pages. Uh, every year, you have to report to the threat to the IRS what you're doing with your money. Uh, and it's now a much more complicated and comprehensive report. Uh, and that kind of uh, transparency is not required for, pri for, for uh, private sector organizations uh, unless they happen to be publicly uh, held and, and uh, the bulk of, of, of private sector organizations are not. Uh, so there's a great deal of flexibility that you have in a, in a for-profit firm that you don't have in a nonprofit in terms of the way you use your money. And lastly, the governmental responsibilities that are covered uh, that provide for externalities are generally paid for by and large by individuals. The vast majority of tax revenue comes from individuals, and that uh, includes all three sectors. Um, with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to simply close. Is a good policy? Challenge, did you ask me to talk about the governor uh, privatization, the role of government privatization? Is it good policy to privatize? Well, the question is are there savings? Is it more efficient? Is it more effective in the long and short term? Uh, is there flexibility and better targeting and application? These are some of the criteria that a governor ought to look, look at when deciding whether or not a particular service uh, should be privatized. What are the effects uh, on the employees, this though, from where the savings come? I mentioned that earlier. Uh, does the capacity exist to, to privatize certain uh, uh, activities? Um, uh, is there a transition strategy? You know that uh, we have the internet, right, which is a privately held uh, uh, system, but we wouldn't have gotten it unless we had gone to the moon, right? So the whole notion of satellites and everything was a pu public investment, paid for, and then uh, eventually when it reached a certain level of maturity, is privatized. Uh, and the government should also look at the political risks and rewards. Can this privatization activity take place? Uh, who are the key stakeholders? Uh, what are the potential penalties uh, in the long term of long-term thinking? As you know, uh, when when Kennedy said, let's go to the moon in a decade, which is, you know, he didn't even know he was going to be assassinated, but that was long after he left office. He set a goal for something to happen long after he left, he left office and, would, and managed through leadership to commit enough resources to make it happen. Little did he know that one day the internet might be born as a result of that activity. Uh, and if you begin to think of the impact of the internet on our, on our world, there's no way in the world that the private sector would have invested, nor could the private sector function today, or any of the three sectors function today without it. So the notion of long-term planning requires a kind of political leadership and consensus around leadership uh, that is rarely seen in this kind of political diatribe that is occurring in today's politics. Uh, so I, I honestly don't know what extent a government can build that level of consensus to provide that kind of leadership. Uh, but, uh, but without it, uh, I don't think we can, we can have any way near the kind of progress or the relationship among the three sectors <coughs> that we've been able to build uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, thank you all, and we'll, uh, we'll take questions later.